Maintain the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace, and say no more of the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Holy and gracious God, I confess that I have not led my heart to the will of the nation of the Israelites at all. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not allowed you to possess myself. I have not acted according to your will. I have grieved with your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on me. Forgive me in accordance with your riches and your graces. Make me holy in the hands of the Lord and your God, so that I can live to the grace of your glory. Amen. In the mercy of all my God, Jesus Christ came and I told you, and for his sake, not to be a mother to him. You who were, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ.
pray. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to earth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumult of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. First lesson comes from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish, such as, as has never occurred since nations first became first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in a book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We will sing together Psalm 16. washed with pure water, 
let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as <coughs> is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead me astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of war, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Peace of God, grace and peace to you, for God our Father. One day, Jesus and his friends had been praying in the temple. As they walked out, Bartholomew, one of his disciples, was looking all around. His eyes got so big and his mouth dropped wide open. Wow, Bartholomew said. Jesus, can you believe the size of these buildings? Just look at these huge stones they're built from. A couple of the disciples started laughing at Bartholomew. They've been to Jerusalem before. Oh, come on, Bartholomew, someone said. Haven't you ever seen big buildings before? <clears throat> Excuse me, where did you come from anyway? A little village, said Bartholomew, just south of Samaria. This is the first time I've ever been so far from home. Yep, said Jesus as they walked along. These buildings are huge, but I'll tell you a secret. One day all these buildings will fall down, every single stone. And Jesus walked on ahead with Bartholomew, talking about how eventually even the biggest and best things people make will wear out and tumble to the ground. I think Jesus wanted to get Bartholomew out of earshot since the other disciples were still laughing at him. But the two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew and James and John, got to talking. Why do you suppose Jesus told Bartholomew that the temple was going to come down someday? Asked James. When do you suppose that's going to happen? Asked Andrew. These buildings are built to last, said John. I bet they won't fall down until the end of the world. Wait a minute, said Peter. Do you mean Jesus is telling Bartholomew when the world is coming to an end? I bet he is, said James. Not fair, said Andrew. How come he didn't tell all of us? Why don't we ask him, said John. You ask him, said Peter. Jesus will tell you anything. Well, by the time they caught up with Jesus and Bartholomew, they were on a hill outside the city, looking back across to the temple in the distance. Jesus said, John, tell us what's going to happen at the end of the world, said John. Yes, said James, how will we know the end is coming? Yes, said Peter, you're the Messiah, you must know. 
I heard a preacher say that there would be signs, said John, like wars and earthquakes and people starving. Hey, said Andrew, I heard there were people starving right now in some other country. That's right, said Peter, and there was an earthquake just a couple of years ago, and there's always wars going on. Is this the end of the world? Oh, no. Okay, you guys, said Jesus. Let's slow down just a bit. Why are you asking about the end of the world? Oh, said Peter, we thought you were telling Bartholomew about the end of the world. No, said Jesus. Then they all sort of stared at each other for a moment. But still, said John, what about the, what the preacher said? Signs, wars, earthquakes. Don't get all worried, kids, said Jesus. It's kind, kind of like when a woman has a baby. A long while before the baby comes out, she starts to feel her tummy starting to squeeze. It's like that. With what you hear about wars and earthquakes and people starving. That stuff happens first, but the end is still a long way off. Some people were saying that the preacher I heard was really the Messiah, said John. No way, said Peter. Jesus is the Messiah. What's all, what's that? That's all part of first birth pains, Jesus said. Lots of people will come saying they are actually me. Don't you believe it? Just keep on loving God and loving other people. You'll be fine. This text reminds me of the old story about the optimistic boy who woke up early on his birthday and looked out his window to see a giant pile of manure in the yard outside. He ran down the stairs, got a shovel, and started having a shovel. <clears throat> what are you doing, asked the friend. I know there's got to be a pony in there somewhere, said the boy. This text reflects Jewish apocalyptic theology's vision of the time of suffering preceding the coming of the Messiah which was sometimes described in terms of labor pains. Jesus doesn't specifically answer the question that the disciples asked in when. The wars, earthquakes, and famines show only that the birth is coming, not when it will come. Mark places this text right before the passion of Jesus Christ. The message to his persecuted community is that they need to prepare to participate in Jesus' suffering and eventual victory by maintaining the witness to the truth in difficult times. The text intends to give them hope and encourage steadfastness and faith in the face of the challenges to come. To seek in this its purpose, which is to encourage persistence in the present, not to peer into the future. New Testament scholar Hugh Anderson describes this text as issue and appeal to faith to recognize and conceal the tribulations of the present lies the coming glory of God to be manifested finally in the corosa of the Son of Man, whose own triumph is hidden in Jesus' way of the cross. I had to look that word up, corosa. It means arrival of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This text on the surface seems to, fill, to be filled with bad news and warnings of tribulations to come. Mark Luther famously tried slapping off once. He depended on the spirit to take up the slap, but it didn't work out quite so well. The story goes that Luther, then a professor at the University of Wittenberg, decided one week that he would take Mark 1311 at face value. He spent no time whatsoever on his Sunday sermon and instead worked on his commentary on the Psalms. <clears throat> He later recounted what happened when he ascended the high pulpit of the castle church of Wittenberg and looked out over the sea of expectant faces. Sure enough, the Holy Spirit spoke to him, and the Spirit said, Martha, you did not prepare. Winston Churchill, British orator and prime minister during World War II, knew about persistence during wars and rumors of wars. He famously said, Never give in, never get in, give in. Never, 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 in things great or small, large or petty, never get in, except to convictions of honor and good sense. He also offered this advice in the darkest days of World War II. If you're going through hell, keep going. This saying is an apt summary of the good news that is to be found beneath the pile of 
fears and famines, pains and persecutions of Mark 13. Country singer Rodney Aikens echoes Churchill's words in his lyrics to, if you're going to hell, keep on going. Well, you know those times when you feel like there's a sign there on your back. Says, I don't mind if you kick me. Seems like everybody has. Things go from bad to worse. You think they couldn't get any worse. And then they do. If you're going to hell, keep on going. Don't slow down. If you're scared, don't show it. You may have to get out before the devil you know you're there. This all begs the question, when we're going through hell, how can we keep on going? The answer, by remembering two pieces of very good news concealed in the file of pains, pains and per persecutions of this text. The Holy Spirit supports us in every dreaded encounter and event. And two, the one who keeps the faith and endures to the end will participate in Jesus' victory over death. In our reading, Jesus' disciples wanted to know when it was all going to end, but Jesus wasn't into giving times and dates. In fact, he put it quite bluntly, bluntly in Matthew's account. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So one thing we know for sure about when Jesus will return, if someone tells you they know what it is, they are wrong. We've all had a giggle at the various predict predictions of impending doom and annihilation. I had a quick peek at Wikipedia and found more than 50 days of which the world was supposed to have ended, and a dozen more for the future. Most are from well-meaning but misguided folks, reading rather too much of the scripture, and they're not all nutters either. There are some big names, Mark the Tourist, world ends by 400. Pope Sylvester the second, Jesus returns at 1000. Mark Luther, 1600. Christopher Columbus, 1656. Plus mathematician and scientists such as Napier, 1688. Bernoulli, 1719. And Sir Isaac Newton who was bitten by the millennium of 2000. Even John Wesley had a punt at 1836. There are some nutters too. In 1806, a chicken started laying eggs with Christ is coming etched under the shell. Now the burning bush was where it granted, and you got Bailey's donkey and all. But why God would want to make a major announcement via handy bone beats me. Turns out that I've been a hoax, you know what I'm saying? The chicken's owner apparently wrote the message in mildest passage and then shoved the eggs back up where the sun don't shine. Seriously, some people have too much spare time and should not be allowed to eat chickens. But all of this is a sideshow. What Jesus is saying in this passage is that the exact date and time are really not important. So we should not be wasting our energy trying to figure it out. We should not spending our time scouring the news for signs of Jesus' imminent return. Instead, we should be concentrating on living right now. All we know is that Jesus will return, and in the meantime, let's make sure we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. There was a young woman who lived in an apartment in a very rough neighborhood. It was the east end of a very large city. Many of the people who lived in this neighborhood got by on welfare. Uh, others earned their living any way they could. The young woman moved into an apartment because it was close to the office where she worked. The rent was cheap and quite frankly, she was young and foolish. She ignored all the warnings of her family and friends and moved into the apartment, convinced that she could handle anything that came her way. Her neighborhood contained the most unsavory of characters. The office where she worked was just down the street from her apartment. And every morning as she walked to work, she would meet some of her neighbors, returning home from an evening of flying the trade on the streets and in the alleys. Each morning she would meet at the entrance to her office by an old man named Ed. Ed had been living on the streets for years. He was hair very hairy, very dirty, and he tended to rant and rave a lot. Ed was a wild man. He slept on the doorstep of the young woman's office because it was somewhat protected. Winter weather. 
Even though it had made the young woman nervous, she got used to seeing him on the way. It always gave the young woman a warm welcome when she arrived. He knew that when she got inside, she would brew fresh coffee. He used to tease her that she was a sucker for a sad face. As he waited patiently for her to bring him a cup of coffee, they never talked much, though. Edward just ran and raved about the injustices of the world. The young woman never found out how he ended up on the streets. She didn't know how he spent his days. As Christmas approached, the young woman became very busy with the preparations for the holiday. This was the first year that she had more money than she needed to celebrate with. She decorated her apartment. She brought all sorts of gifts and spent hours wrapping each one. This year she wasn't going to be rushed. She wasn't going to miss out on anything. Christmas wasn't going to come and go without finding her in the Christmas spirit. That year the young woman had drawn the short straw and had to work on Christmas Eve. So before she left her apartment, she packed a small package of goodies for Ed. She was delighted that she was so well prepared that she could make time for others. But when she got to the office, Ed was nowhere in sight. She asked some of the women who worked the streets if they had seen old Ed, but no one knew where he was. The young woman went about her duties and soon forgot all about old Ed. She finished her work in early and went off to celebrate Christmas Eve with her friends. She had been looking forward to Christmas for weeks and was eager to celebrate. Together she and her friends shared a fine Christmas meal with all the trimmings and then they went off to a candlelight service. The service was beautiful. They really pulled out all the stops, great music, lots of activity. The preacher even managed to keep his sermon brief, but somehow the young woman was left feeling like there was something missing. The next morning, she celebrated with her family. Her nieces eagerly unpacked dozens of presents, and on the whole, the family managed to keep their disagreements down to a minimum that year. But the young woman felt detached, like she was just going through the motions. Despite all the elaborate trimmings, she felt like she had missed out on her fair share of the Christmas spirit. As she drove back to her apartment in the city, she found herself wondering if this was all there was to it. Christmas had come and gone, and she didn't feel like anything had changed. By the time she had parked her car, she was feeling quite depressed. Christmas was over, and nothing much had changed. When she got to the entrance of her apartment, she saw Ed. She had never seen him anywhere near her apartment before, and it made her more than a little nervous. She wondered how he had found out where she lived. Indeed, it frightened her that Ed had taken the trouble to find her apartment. Ed looked very agitated. Nervously, the young woman greeted Ed and asked him why he was at her doorstep. Ed explained that he needed her help. The young woman became very uneasy. The odd cup of coffee at work was one thing, but this old man showing up on her doorstep was quite another. And now he wanted something. Ed asked the young woman if she would come to with him to the farm. Caught off guard, the young woman reluctantly agreed. When they arrived in the park, Ed introduced the young woman to Karen. Karen was a very scared looking teenager. She could have been more than about 14 years old. Ed explained to the young woman that Karen had run away from home on Christmas Eve. He said that lots of kids ended up on the streets at this time of year and there were usually lots of unsavory characters to meet them when they arrived. When Karen arrived at the city bus stop, Ed had spotted her. From the moment she arrived, Ed had carefully watched over Karen, making sure that she came to no harm in the city. Karen's two days on the streets and Ed's gentle persuasion had convinced her that she should really go back home and try to work out things with her parents. Ed explained to the young woman that Karen needed money for a bus ticket. After they had called Karen's parents and safely loaded her on the bus, the young woman asked Ed if he would come and share a meal with her. Ed refused the offer of meal, but agreed to share a cup of coffee with the young woman. In the coffee shop, the young woman took a hard look, long hard look at Ed. The night in the coffee shop, she looked into the eyes of a wild man. She didn't know it then, but she is she knows now in her own way that Ed had helped her to prepare the way for Christ. 
It was a prophet who pointed to Christ. She had almost missed him. Christ had come. She was busy looking up, but she had forgotten to look around. Christ came to her and cared. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Christ comes to us in the most unlikely of places, wearing the most unlikely of faces. Just as Advent moves us toward the remembrance of the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem in the first century, it also reminds us that most of the world was preoccupied and utterly unprepared for the first Advent, and many miss the whole thing. The question is, will we miss the whole thing again? For we do not know the day or the hour, no one knows. Therefore keep awake, Christ may come suddenly and find us asleep. So be prepared, be prepared keep awake. Watch, for we know not when Christ comes. Watch, so that we might be found whenever and wherever Christ comes. Watch, prepare the way for Christ. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. David Brody called me last night. Uh, they like flight to Irving to the hospital in Miami. Uh, they didn't know what had happened. The EPMTs had to help her up. David thought she might have had a mini stroke, but he said she was doing better and was able to eat. And he wanted us to pray for her today. Dear Lord God, our Heavenly Father, be with her and David and family as she recuperates in the Miami hospital. Watch over them and we pray she will make it fast and easy recovery. Watch over her, David, and family and bring them safely home in the coming days. Just we pray in your holy name. Amen.
Christian response to the mercy of God is to receive our prayer. Rooted in God's abundant love for the world, let us pray for our believers, the church, and all creation. O oh God, in the washing of water, you set us free from the power of sin and death. Unite all the baptized in the covenant you have made with us as we strive for your justice and peace in all of the earth. Merciful God, you see our prayer. prayer. By your merciful might, you sustain all creation. Stir us from complacency with the harm we inflict on the earth and urge us to adopt sustainable ways of life that protect and restore our planet. Merciful God, receive our prayer. With the selfless power, you protect all who take refuge in you. As nations rise against nations, defend all who are displaced or affected by war or violence, especially Ukraine and the Middle East. Empower all people and nations to pursue peace. Merciful God, in your presence, you give fullness of joy. Care for all whom joy feels distant. Be present with persons experiencing depression, anxiety, addiction, or any mental illness. Bring them healing and wholeness. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Through the years, you have gathered your church in this community for the worship. <laughs> fellowship, information, and service. Enable us to look beyond the walls of our building to, per to perceive where you are calling us forward. Merciful God, receive our prayer. With thanksgiving, remember Elizabeth of, of Hungary and all the saints and angels who delight in your everlasting presence. As their lives inspire ours, provoke us always to love holding fast to the confession of our hope in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. At this time, if there's anything that you or you know who needs prayer right now, it's a simple time. Thank you for this time of silence to reflect your, your will, your wisdom, your strength, your power, and your awesome uh, authority that you have over us as your children. We thank you that you have listened to our hearts, whether out loud or in prayer. We pray, especially those who are prayerless, we pray for the Lowly family, and we pray for all those that we need in our hearts. Again, whether it's silent or loud, but let them know that you are near. Draw us near as we draw near you. But most important, ask me in Jesus' name, will you abide in us as we abide together as one? And this is Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We offer the heart prayers to you, gracious God, trusting in your flow of God's love for all that you have made. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, as grains of wheat, <coughs> excuse me, as gathered of wheat scattered upon the hills were gathered together from one grave. So let your church be gathered from the ends of the earth. 
and to your kingdom. For yours is the glory in Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray as our Father's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Know the love of Christ as your passion knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. At this time, I bring announcements. I just want to give a reminder that next Sunday, Pastor Jane will be here. We'll be having communion. It is also the last Sunday of our church year, Christ the King Sunday. And we will be having our special service, kind of a year in review uh, service on that Sunday. So please join us next Sunday for Christ the King Sunday. Pardon? Oh, also, um, we do have a family that we are providing a Thanksgiving dinner for. And um, my Kentucky mommy, if you haven't had a chance uh, to see me sometime, I'm going to do special, I got a special deal on a turkey. So that's already done. I don't get all the. All the goodies go with it now, so <coughs> watch it for Thanksgiving Day. Well, if nothing additional, we'll go with the scene.